Well, it's uh, such an honor to have you here, friends. So, um, Thank you. And um, I spent uh, the weekend rereading these essays, and they just um, it's rare that I, I read something that makes me laugh out loud even once. And I must have laughed out loud maybe 25 times as I was reading these. So um, I just I enjoyed them so much. Thank I you. thought I thought what I would do is um, start out by reading a little bit um, of it, and uh, that will segue into a, a question. But this is one of the many many passages that I just thought were sort of sparklingly uh, funny and um, observant. This is from an essay called The Right of Eminent Domain from your, your first, uh, your first um, collection. Once upon a time, long, long ago, people wanted to be well-spoken. Those capable of an elegant turn of phrase were much admired. Wit was in great demand. It was the day of the epigram. Time went on, and, and by and by it came to pass that people were chiefly interested in being well-liked. Those capable of a firm handshake were much admired. Friendliness was in great demand. It was the day of the telegram. Presently, it appears that people are mainly concerned with being well-rested. <laughs> Those capable of uninterrupted sleep are much admired. <laughs> Unconsciousness is in great demand. <laughs> this is the day of the milligram. Um, so um, I was just curious, after reading that passage, um, what you think, what, what age we are in now, and whether we'll, we're still uh, asleep. Do you think we're still asleep? Or has, uh, 9-11 changed that? Has, has it woken us up? Or? Well, first of all, I mean, I don't remember exactly. I could find it. I was probably about 22 when I wrote that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, uh, what age? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what age curious, are we in now? Do you think we're still asleep, uh, or have things changed? Um, I think that things have changed, and yet we are still asleep. Okay. Yes. All right. You know, um, so I, I hadn't really thought about this because I hadn't thought about that in such a long time. But maybe that's why things are not changed okay. because people are asleep. I'm still asleep. I mean, that would be putting the best face on it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I would hate to think this was deliberate. <laughs> okay. You know. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, one thing I really responded to about your book was that it's a portrait of yourself, and yet uh, this was unintentional. Unintentional. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, and it, it's a portrait that's done almost exclusively through uh, voicing of opinion and social observation. There's, I, I don't think, I mean, aside from confessing that you like to sleep and smoke a lot. Yes, um, still true, although sleeping, I can't do. Oh, okay. Um, but there's nothing that could be construed as personal at all, and I'm just wondering why you made that choice. Uh, decorum. Decorum. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I wish people would follow that. You know. Okay. <laughs> I, I, um, Yes, I don't think you should disclose personal information. Okay. I mean, and I mean you. Me, personally. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, he, I mean, and even then I thought that when it was much less prevalent, obviously, than it is now. But it was the beginning of it. You know, it has nothing to do with technology. People think it's about technology. You know, but technology just allows you to do it, you know, uh, with more people, with a, great, a larger audience. Mm -hmm. But the idea of telling a lot of personal things about yourself um, was started in the 70s. Um, and uh, it was bad enough without this dissemination, you know. I, I don't want people to do this because I'm not that interested in them, mm -hmm. you know. And I don't think people should be encouraged to do it because they are not that interesting, <laughs> you know. So that it's basically to avoid boredom that I try to get people not to do this. To avoid boredom. Yes, and I don't actually think, because what people tell you as personal is mostly emotional. That's really what they mean. When people say, I think this, I think that, it's almost never true. You know, what they mean is, I feel this, I feel that. You know, most people don't think at all. You know, so certainly, <laughs> so certainly people aren't thinking in these great droves, you know. Um, so I don't want to hear about people's emotional lives. I mean, that is something I feel I have to tolerate for my close friends. You know, <laughs> it is like the price of them listening to you, okay? Um, but I really, I, I, I know people are riveted, apparently, by this. They're really interested in other people. I don't know why, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what reality television is. That's what all that stuff is. I mean, it's some heightened version of it or some worse version. I guess people watch these things because they think, I'm not as bad as that. You know, and that is probably true. You're probably not as bad as that. You know, um, but you're bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think of the, the ascendancy of the memoir? In, in, uh, well, that's, what, that's what I mean. Yeah. You know, don't um. do this. You know, I mean, when people first started doing it in, 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 in drugs, it was also, I believe, probably in the late 70s, early 80s, maybe it was in the 80s, um, and 
Everyone noticed it at first. See, what happens when something takes over is that people stop noticing it. But everyone noticed it at first. Um, and people kind of left at it because uh, people were too young to do it. The first thing that people noticed was that you were too young to write a memoir. A memoir you're supposed to do when you're old, you know, when you have something to remember. Um, <laughs> It, it, you know, it's the same as like an artist having a retrospective. You know, in, in New York, it, I remember sometime in the 70s, they gave a retrospective of the Guggenheim to someone who was like 35. You know, and it was a joke. But now it's common, by the way. The longer people live, the faster they want to remember and have retrospectives. It doesn't really make sense. Um, so there's that, that people are too young to write memoirs. And there's also that most people's lives are not deserving of being put between hard covers. I, I really believe that. If your life is that interesting, someone else will write a book about you. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I was reading your Paris Review um, interview, which I think was in the early 90s. Um, and, 1890s. Um, 1890s. <laughs> um, and you said something that I thought was really interesting, which was that, um, you know, experience with a capital E is, um, drawing from experience with a capital E is only necessary for mediocre writers. Um, and what exactly did you, did you mean by that? You know, I, don't, I, I haven't read that since I did it probably, but, and I remember that George, uh, George Plimpton was constantly asking me a question about Hemingway. Mm -hmm. You know, he was like stuck in a time machine, George. Um, and, uh, you know, he to me is an example of that. You know, um, some people may think a fine example, I don't agree. Uh, but there was, I don't think this is so true anymore, by the way. This is one good thing about current life. But there was certainly a long period of time where uh, people, uh, uh, writers, especially uh, male writers, um, would kind of chase the, uh, a, a certain kind of, you know, extremely colorful experience. You know, working on a fishing boat, you know, shooting tigers, or, you know, things that were uh, tests of uh, masculinity or, um, or that were exotic, you know, or exotically erotic or, um, and what I think what I said was, that, you know, that kind of um, uh, extremely vivid material, you know, when it isn't really yours, first of all, I mean, you might actually be someone who works on a fishing boat, then it's okay. Then chances are you're probably not going to be a very good writer, but, um, <laughs> but I, 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 I might be in there, I don't remember. But I had read, some, uh, I was reading something about Chekhov, and Chekhov said that uh, I could walk past a, a barrack, look uh, in the lighted window and see a soldier and write a story. Mm -hmm. And that is true because he's Chekhov. Right. Okay? <laughs> and you are not Chekhov. Okay? <laughs> and I really think, you know, if you're not Chekhov, then go to medical school. Do something else. <laughs> You know, I mean, medical school too, didn't yeah. they? <laughs> I mean, there's, yes, well, and do something else. Yes, that was a poor example. Um, <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> um. I, but I, it's not necessary. It, you know, it, it's, it's necessary if you're a, a reporter. Or, and I like some of those kind of things to read. I mean, I read a book a, a year or two ago. That someone said, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading a book called The Tiger. They said, what's it about? I said, a tiger. <laughs> it's about a tiger. It's about a tiger in Siberia. It was actually a book about a tiger in Siberia. It was terrific. Um, but it wasn't a novel. Um, and it was written by people who knew about these tigers in Siberia. But that is not, um, that's not why you should write. Or at least that's not... Uh, why you should write if you expect me to read it. Mm. Um, you've been called the funniest woman in America. At least it's um, on the front of your book, and uh, I think it may be true. I wonder... Um, well, it's true it's on the front of my book. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <I laughs> I wonder what you think of um, Christopher Hitchens' now uh, infamous assertion that women are um, less funny than men. I think he may have even sort of contacted you when he was writing that famous... Yes, he, he did contact me, um, <coughs> but obviously it didn't work because he wrote the story anyway. He wrote the story anyway. Yes. Um, yes. Do, do you... Uh, it's ridiculous. It's, yeah, it's absurd. You know, he did it to be provocative. Chris, you know, Hitchens did a lot of things to be provocative. Um, you know, not exactly an adult thing, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. um, and not a thing that women generally do. Women generally find real life to be challenging enough. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's a ridiculous thing. Every person who has a brain in their head uh, knows that that isn't true. I mean, it certainly it was true for a very long time that as a profession, yes, it was kind of closed to women. That is true. Um, but uh, that's not the same thing as not being funny. You know, it's just an idiotic thing. 
you think there's a difference between male and female humor? Um, in some respects, there is, not generally. I mean, there's certain things that only men find funny. You know, I, and these are things that I would call, you know, idiotic. Okay. Can you give us some examples? Of- yeah. I mean, the Three Stooges. Okay? That's the right. Three Stooges are not funny, and all things like The Three Stooges, you know, because it's not just The Three Stooges, you know, it's all kinds of movies and all kinds of cartoons and all kinds of things. Only, you, people say only men find them funny because these are things that boys think are funny. And that is because, you know, men are boys. Um, so that I don't find those things funny. I don't care if they find them funny, you know, but they're not funny. Uh, you've um, expressed your admiration for Dorothy Parker and uh, James Thurber. And, and, you know, when I was reading these essays, I thought um, a little bit of, of S.J. Perelman. Um, um, and I was just wondering how you felt about the sort of younger generation of, of comic writers. And it seems to me that when you open, say, a copy of The New Yorker these days, it, you'd be sort of hard-pressed to find a short story that wasn't on some level comic. I mean, you have writers like Laurie Moore and George Saunders. And, of course, you have the, the memoirists um, like um, Sarah Vowell and, and David Sedaris. But, I mean, do you f- are you heartened by this sort of new crop of, of, uh, of comic writers, of humorists, or, or not? Um, some of them are funny. Mm-hmm. Some of the time. I mean, Laurie Moore is more of a short story writer. She is funny. Yes, she's quite funny. She is funny. She's funnier than some of these funny writers, I have to say. Um, yet she's a girl. Kind of surprising. Um, I mean, but uh, I'm heartened by it. I mean, I think um, I never really thought about it that way. I feel directly responsible for it, however. <laughs> I mean, uh, I do feel directly responsible for it because when I uh, uh, was about to publish my first book, um, they, the, the, the idea was that it would never sell because this kind of thing was over. There was no written humor. There was no, you know, and p- people kept saying, that's something from the 20s. You know, that thing is over. Um, and that, th- they always say that about something until there's one that isn't over, that is a success, and then, you know, it becomes a trend. Uh, so, yes, I think it's a good thing. Of course it's a good thing. Okay. Yeah, I, I only ask because uh, this is also, I mean, it was part of the Paris Review um, interview, which, you know, obviously was, it was a while ago, but, um, you talked about there being a kind of carefulness among, among young writers, and I think you, you made the analogy of, um, uh, you, you called them investment bankers with word processors. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't, the, these writers weren't young writers then, these writers weren't around then, except maybe yes, Laurie but, Moore maybe uh, was, I don't remember. She's older than, certainly than some of these people, right? Yes, yes, a bit. Um, okay, well, I was just wondering if you still found that to be the case or not. Um, um, that they're careful? Um, you mean, as I, I, I don't really know what I was talking. I don't know what I was referring to. Okay, all right. So, Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm certain I didn't name any names. I never do. No, no, you didn't name any names. Okay. So uh, I only did that on the phone. Um, <laughs> um, in the documentary, Public Speaking, the Scorsese documentary, you um, lament the fact that we live in a culture that's utterly soaked in nostalgia, and I thought that was um, absolutely true. I mean, it seems very true to me. Just look at the state of contemporary music, for example. You know, if you turn on the radio, it sounds like... A lot of this music has been recorded 60 years ago. Um, and um, I just, I was wondering why you think we've forgotten how to, you know, as Ezra Pound put it, make it new. Well, I haven't forgotten. <laughs> okay. Well. Okay. Um, I, I talked to some students earlier today. You know, I was saying, this is their job. That's, that is the job of, a, of people who are young, mm-hmm. to do new things. That is their job. They don't seem to know that that's their job. Um, it is probably our fault that they don't know that's not their job. It's not my fault because I don't have children. But it is, the f- <laughs> it is certainly the fault of their parents. You know, and I don't mean maybe their specific parents, I don't know them, but it is certainly the fault of my generation that was so dominant and dominating and domineering, you know, that even I got sick of it. Um, it, it is true that, I mean, that popular music is, sounds like music of when I was young. Some of it is exactly that music. Um, and I think that's, pro- you know, I don't know all the reasons for it, um, but I know that it's very bad for a culture to be so retrograde, that is for sure. You know, and, I, you know, I think that maybe it's because there is so much innovation in technology. You know, these things are unimaginable, or would have been unimaginable, that maybe we can only do one thing at a time. You know, so that it must be a very exciting era if you're interested in science, you know, or technology, I make the distinction. Um, that it must be a very exciting, because they seem to be very excited. Look, they can do this, I can do that, I can do that. Um, but the content on these things is old. 
You know, and that is very disturbing to me because, you know, yes, you can do this and you can get this information very fast, but what is the information? You know, and it allows for, you know, the spread of uh, bad ideas very quickly. You know, bad old ideas. You know, nothing is more contagious than a bad old idea. You know, and so I don't know the reason for it, but I know that the people who will solve it will not be me. Because I have never done that. I, you know, I don't think... Uh, when people say things uh, didn't th things used to be better, I always try to uh, you know um, remind people that the, th the thing that was better was that they were 21. <laughs> that th you were better. You know? <laughs> so you have to make a distinction between you and the world. And the fact that people don't make that distinction is so somewhat caused by these memoirs. Mm. <laughs> okay, by thinking that you are the world. Mm -hmm. And you, if uh, in the Scorsese documentary you talk about the fact that you don't really partake in the use of technology, um, I would say you drop the really. I don't. You partake don't. In the you S. don't have a cell phone. You don't use a computer. I don't. You don't even have a microwave. Is this? No, I have right. no. I have none of these things. Um, and that is, I, I don't remember whether I explained it in the movie or not. I, I know I explained to these students today. Um, the reason I don't have these things is not that I have um, uh, an aversion to high technology. It's that I have an antipathy to all machines. You know, I have owned the same car since 1978. One year ago, I learned how to open the hood. Okay? <laughs> so um, I didn't, I never owned a typewriter. You know, I didn't have the old machines, so I didn't replace them with the new machines. Um, when they invented the computer, uh, or not invented, but when people started getting it, a friend of mine who was a writer got a word processor, that's what they were call called then, she showed me, and it looked to me like a very fast typewriter. So I thought, I don't need a very fast typewriter. I don't type. So I didn't get one. Um, I didn't know the entire world was going to go into these machines. I had no way of knowing that, obviously. If I did, I'd be very rich. Um, and um, so I'm just not interested in the machines. Now I see that, of course, the entire world has gone into these machines. But one thing I did notice about these machines, which I do think I just say in the movie, is that they don't work. None of them work. Um, and that I can prove this by the fact that every single corporation has an entire department to fix them. <laughs> okay, so you wouldn't have these fixing departments called IT departments if these things worked. When there were typewriters, every company did not have a department, department that fixed typewriters. Okay, so uh, the phones used to work, the regular phones, they all used to work. I think people wanted these things so much that they bought them before they were finished inventing them. And they figured, well, they're buying them, we don't have to finish inventing them. So when they finish inventing them, I will buy one. <laughs> Well, one thing that you talk about as well in the documentary is that you feel like, I mean, when you are out walking the streets of New York, you're experiencing New York. And one thing that um, has happened because of the advent of technology, the advent of cell phones in particular, and smart, so-called smartphones, is that people are constantly on their phones doing this, and they're not actually engaging in the world anymore. Um, I guess that's not really a question, is it? It's just a uh, <laughs> reason. But it's true, but I mean, uh, everyone walks around like this. So when you're doing that, that's where you are. You're, that's where you are. You are not, you know, on 33rd Street. You are there, wherever that is. Um, you know, at, this is, again, everyone lives in a world of one. You know, this is where they bang into you in the street. You know, I guess they think, she'll move. It's, uh, not me. So, um, it's left the field of observing real life all to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whenever I say to people, did you notice they goes, no, I didn't notice that. And, I th and they go, I don't want to notice that. I said, it because you were doing this, that's why you didn't notice that. Um, one of my um, favorite essays in the book is, is called Writers on Strike, A Chilling Prophecy. Um, and it's where you posit a New York where all the writers just decide to stop writing, or they, or they all they experience sort of um, collective writer's block. Um, Except instead of it being like uh, described as something miserable or some sort of form of agony, it's described as a sort of utopia. Um, this is actually, maybe I'll read a tiny bit of, of this. This was written in an era where there were still strikes that worked. Okay. <laughs> this, I'll just read a few lines here. But um, uh, now on this, particularly, this particular Sunday afternoon, a phenomenon has occurred. Every single writer in the city of New York is not writing. Once knowledge of this has spread throughout the entire non-writing writing community, a tremendous feeling of mutual relief and well-being is experienced. For an exquisite moment, all the writers in New York like each other. If no one can write, then it is obviously not the fault of the writers. It must be their fault. Um, and um, I guess I'm just curious about your, um, 
I guess I'd say adversarial relationship to writing um, sometimes, which comes across in the book, um, where you really describe it as being sort of uh, agonizing to sit down in front That's of. That's sort of. Not sort of, very much, okay. Um, and I guess the natural sort of question would be, if it is such agony, what, what drives you to, to pick up the pen and, and write? Well, I don't pick it up that often, let's face it. Um, <laughs> Uh, because I can do it. I mean, it is something I can do, you know, by which I mean it is an ability that I have. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, I became a writer because when I was a child, I loved to write. Um, I loved to write right up to the second that I got my first actual writing assignment, writing job. And that was the very first time that I didn't like to write. And so I realized that I have such um, an antipathy to authority that I have it even to my own authority. You know, so that if I tell myself, Fran, write, I'll say, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but the, the actual, the profound cause of this, I have no idea. Mm. Because I really am not that um, reflective. And, and what were the first books that made you want to, to write? Put, put I think as soon as, as soon as I discovered that people wrote books, I, pr I probably was maybe six years old or something, or seven years old. Before that, I thought they were just there like trees, you know. Um, you know, the, and it never occurred to me that a person could do something like that, you know, that, as astonishing as write a book, you know. I mean, certainly not any of the people I knew at the age of six. Um, so it seemed, it seemed to me very much to be something like a tree. You know, uh, like a tree is an amazing thing. A person cannot make a tree. A person cannot write a book. But when I found out that people wrote books, then oh, instantly I wanted to write, write, uh, be a writer. Um, there were only a few other things I ever thought about doing in my life. You know, I, I, when I was a child, I also thought about I wanted to be a cellist. Um, I played the cello, but um, uh, I was just remarkably untalented at this. So I did not pursue it. Um, even I could see I was untalented while I was doing it. Um, uh, and then I had a very brief flirtation with wanting to be a toll taker. Um, because <laughs> when I was a child, I associated toll takers with the glamour of travel. <laughs> <laughs> and because when I was a child, they were they wore uniforms. And I thought, this is a wonderful job. You know, you're always traveling. I didn't realize they were, they were not actually traveling. <laughs> they were there. You're always traveling. You get to wear a uniform, and people hand you money. <laughs> Now it's kind of like being a senator. <laughs> so, um, just judging from the work of yours that I've read, I, I'm assuming you take a sort of um, a dim view on writers' workshops and the whole phenomenon of the sort of. I, I, as I said to the students today, someone asked me one of the, one of these students asked me um, if I had advice for young writers, and I said yes. Don't go to writing school. That is my advice. Um, I realize this is probably not the best venue to voice <laughs> okay, this. It's all right. <laughs> you know, but when I was young, there was a writing school, University of Iowa Writers Workshop. That was maybe it wasn't the only one, but it was one of a few. You know, um, I, I didn't know then, and I do not know now. Not that there are a billion writing schools. What they teach you? What do they teach you there? Writing is a talent. It is not something you can be taught. It is a talent. It is, as I said to these kids, it is like as if you told me you were going to tall school. You know, um, you cannot be made tall and you cannot be made into a writer. I do not know what they teach them there. And um, at the very least, don't borrow money to do this. You know, so, because if you're going to be a writer, you'll never be able to pay it back. That I can tell you. you know? um, so if you want to learn how to write, the things you can't, there's only two things you can learn about writing, I think. You know, one is grammar. In which case, the only way to learn that is to go to Catholic school in the 1950s. <laughs> okay, I have something which I would never share, a list of people I know who went to Catholic school. And people who went to Catholic school in the 50s, I have one friend who went to Catholic school from kindergarten all the way through graduate school. He is, he knows every single splintery grammatical rule. And the reason for this is we learned grammar when I was in school, too. I mean, it was a subject. We learned diagram sentences. But in public school, they didn't hit you if you got it wrong. <laughs> so it, as a subject, so unbelievably boring that the only way you can learn it is if when you get it wrong, someone hits you. <laughs> um, so 
I think the pop, I, I don't I think they probably even do that anymore in Catholic school. They may not even teach grammar anymore in Catholic school. Um, no one cares about it anymore, but I do. So, and it's very important to write her, uh, grammar. So go to Catholic school in the 50s. Um, and the best, I mean, I have asked, num I know numerous people who teach in writing schools, people such as yourself. Um, <laughs> not a writing school, per se, but. <laughs> and I... I always ask them, what do you teach them? <laughs> and they never have a good answer. <laughs> um, one writer uh, said to me, I teach them to read. Mm. Um, I feel that this is kind of late in the day for you to be learning how to read. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe this is what's wrong with the country. That <laughs> people are not expected to learn how to read till they're in college. Yes, I'm not even going <laughs> to go there. <laughs> Um, how are we doing on time? Okay. Um, you, you also say, and I hope I'm, I'm, I think I'm quoting you correctly here, but do you believe um, that there's too much democracy in the culture um, and not enough democracy in society? Um, yes, this is true. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's too much democracy in the culture, by which I mean um, uh, people are uh, encouraged to give their opinion about um, various kinds of works of art, you might call them. Um, uh, uh, in other words, people are encouraged to be critics of things they have no idea how to do. Um, and people are encouraged to be interested in those opinions um, for no reason that I can think of at all. Um, and people are encouraged to participate in the making of works of art at a level that's ridiculous. I mean, do you really think that hundreds of thousands of people are artists? Of course they're not. You know, uh, it's a rare thing. It's not a common thing. You know, no, not every expression of yourself is a work of art. So that is what I mean by too much democracy in the culture. Not enough democracy in the society is exactly what I mean, which is that, you know, which is very simple to, to see what that is, which is that uh, fewer and fewer people have a say over what happens to more and more people, you know, so that, you know, we would benefit stupendously by reversing these two things. You know, what, by more people actually having a participation in the society, um, a real participation, um, which people could have. They have to take it. You know, you can't just, and you can't just vote every four years. You know, it's like what happened in the midterms. And I am actually talking about you people sitting right here. People who, the first time they ever voted, they voted for Obama. And they were so pleased with themselves for doing this. They were so, you could tell, they were just gleaming with self-regard. <laughs> and that was it. Then in the midterms, when I went to vote uh, in the midterms, I live in a neighborhood um, that someone else, I wish it was me, but it wasn't, had called nyu -Istan. Okay, I live in a neighborhood that is largely populated by NYU students. When I went to the polls to vote, I was the youngest person at the polls in the midterms. And that is why the Republicans won the midterms. So you cannot just vote once. So it's your fault. I mean, it's actually your fault. If you're wondering, is there anything your fault? Yes. You may think, I'm too young for anything to be my fault. No. This Congress is your fault. And as I go from school to school around the country, I will blame those people. Because it's not just you, it's all of you. I think we have time for one more, one more question. Um, um, in public speaking, the Scorsese documentary, you say of, of Wendy, Andy Warhol that his most lasting contribution to the culture is that he made fame famous, which I think is, um, which is uh, a wonderful thing to say. I'm wondering what you think of the, of the rise of reality TV and our cultural obsession with these shows, like you know, Jersey Shore and the Kardashians. And, um, and is this an inevitable outgrowth of, of Warhol? Everything bad in the culture is Andy's fault. <laughs> Every single thing. And let me assure you, he would love these shows. Okay? Yeah. He would love them. Um, but every single thing. Uh, that, you know, uh, if there's, there's, a st there's Starbucks in Rome. In Rome. What's the matter? The Italians can't make coffee? <laughs> okay? There's a Starbucks in Rome. That's Andy's fault. Okay? Every single one of these things is Andy's fault. However, I do know, of course, he never imagined this level of success. And I do know that... Uh, these things were meant as a joke. 
you know, I try to explain that in the movie. These things were meant as a joke. They weren't <laughs> meant to be actually done, you know, taken seriously. Um, but they were, and that just proves that people just, you know, don't have a good sense of humor. <laughs> okay, I think it's... Uh... <laughs> we will now be turning to questions from the audience. Please join me in thanking Professor Puckner for participating. <laughs> So, I, ooh. okay, it's a car, just like everything else in California. <laughs> okay, I didn't expect it to move. Okay, um, I'll try not to lean on it. Um, I'm just going to take questions from the audience um, in an entertaining fashion. Um, you don't have to ask them in an entertaining fashion. There's no microphones. You don't have to stand up. I will point to you. If it's inaudible, I will repeat it. I have a microphone. I like to have that on the microphone. So just raise your hand if you have a question. Yes. The question was, uh, what do I think of the notion of political correctness and do I think it inhibits the society from progress? Yes, I do think it inhibits society from progress. Yes, it, it does. I had actually thought of it that way, but yes, it does. Um, political correctness, um, when I first heard the word, I heard this word from an ostensibly very liberal person. Um, you can't say that. I said, why not? He said, that's not correct. Now, to me, correct is something, you know, from like um, an Emily Post book. You know, is this the correct way to address an archbishop or not? Um, something that can be found in the Emily Post books, if you're curious, is the correct way to address an archbishop. Um, and I said, correct. I said, that's a Stalinist word. And it is. You know, a lot of... Uh, the rigidity in the culture is from the left. A lot of it. In fact, most of the rigidity in the culture is from the left. The insanity is from the right. Okay? <laughs> you know? Um, but the rigidity, you know, the, the intolerance, uh, the, the level of intolerance on the left, you know, culturally, is astonishing to me. It is breathtaking to me. This wasn't the point. You know, this wasn't the point to be so inhibiting of people. You know? Yes, you shouldn't say certain things, not, not because you shouldn't say them, but in fact, you shouldn't think them. You know, so this, you know, the part of it that has to do with, for instance, like racism, which is the thing no one ever says it's supposed to have to do with, um, it's not that you shouldn't say racist things, you shouldn't think them. And if you think them, you are wrong. Not incorrect in the Emily Post notion, wrong in the God notion. Yes. Uh, the question was, is there any practice I could uh, um, in encourage a college to promote a culture of art? You did not understand what I was saying. I don't want colleges to promote a culture of art, okay? Not promoting a culture of art is what I meant, okay? You can't promote this. Here's what I'm reminded of. Um, I uh, slightly knew uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was senator from New York, a brilliant man. He was in the Kennedy administration. Um, uh, he was a very young man in the Kennedy administration. And he told me that once there was a conversation, um, I can't remember the details of it, um, where someone said, um, how can we encourage the arts? And um, Pat Monahan said, forbid them. <laughs> <laughs> so there's your answer from Senator Monahan. Yes. Has there been a GOP nomination? I've just been here a few hours. <laughs> so what are my thoughts following you? Has there been a nominee? Oh, the race in general. Um, well, I'm sure, you know, here's one thing that I pretty much believe. My thoughts are the same as yours. <laughs> I mean, this is um, a kind of um, an episode in American history that I think has brought sane people together. I mean, there cannot be a wide divergence of opinion about this. You know, I mean, there really can't. 
you know, I mean, there might be, but <clears throat> I, I think not, um, not among the sane. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I know that a lot of people enjoy it on a certain level, you know, because it's comical. Um, I don't really enjoy it, I have to say, because it's, you know, it's the presidency. You know, I know, like, especially people your age think all things are alike. You know, well, the presidential election, reality TV, oh, they're kind of the same. But they're, like, kind of not, you know. <laughs> They're just, they're like, they're like, really, really not? I don't know how to, you know, I can't tell you how, how, like, everyone acts like the job, the presence that I take is, well, you know, it's, anyone can do this job. Any idiot can do this job. Um, now, the reason we think that, of course, is because we have the Bush administration. <laughs> so, you know, in, th there's obviously hundreds, if not thousands of reasons why it was a catastrophe uh, for the, not just the country, but for the world, the Bush administration. But one of the reasons it was a catastrophe was that people of a certain age, they think this was a president. In other words, this is their template for the presidency, the Bush administration. <laughs> you know, these are people who are so young that they think Ronald Reagan was a great president. <laughs> and they think this because they might have gone to a school called the Ronald Reagan School. <laughs> they landed in an airport called Reagan International. <laughs> Yet, to someone my age, Ronald Reagan was a B actor. <laughs> we were astonished he became the governor even of California. <laughs> so, I mean, if you want to find the source of the present, you know, um, primary, uh, Republican primary, the Reagan governorship. That's, that's the first thing. Because even in California, really, come on. I mean, so Ronald Reagan, who was, I don't know how to put this in a scholarly way, an idiot. <laughs> and yet during the, the second Bush administration, during the, the little Bush administration, you look back and you thought, Ronald Reagan, he wasn't that bad. I mean, you know, <clears throat> as things get progressively worse, you find yourself saying, Richard Nixon, what a genius. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> Because, because one thing Reagan was, was he was the model for the dumb president. You know, before that, you know, there were bad presidents, there were good presidents, there were mediocre presidents, but really no one thought the president should be stupid. Okay? Now that's, they advertise their stupidity. Because they criticize the elites. And by elite, they mean smart. I mean, they don't mean rich. You know, they mean smart. You know, and so they criticize that. You know, I mean, Rick Santorum came out against actual going to school at all. <laughs> He's put his foot down. He's opposed to school. <laughs> I mean, no one's ever run on that platform before. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it strikes me, you know, just at this moment that the person doing the really new thing is Rick Santorum. <laughs> He's groundbreaking. No one ever thought, you know how I might win the presidency? I'm going to come out against school completely. <laughs> because in school, they apparently teach things. <laughs> he is clearly opposed to that. <laughs> okay? So although I also can find the amusement in this, um, I also, you know, I'm old, and I am aware that it is exceptionally dangerous to have these kind of people um, in politics. It's really dangerous to have so many stupid people making important decisions for you and for me. I mean, the President of the United States, that is a hard job. It's a hard job. You have to be, oh, I don't know, smart <laughs> to do this job. And one of the, uh, the uh, uh, platforms, or they're not really platforms anymore, that these Republicans campaign on is they fight with each other as to who is actually less of a politician. I mean, not in the sense of campaigning, but you know, what they now call Washington insider. You know, you were, you know, you were a senator, that's very bad. I was never a senator. I never held any public office. That makes people vote for them. In what other field would this be true? <laughs> I mean, why is this a plus? I mean, do you ever hear anyone say, you know, I need open heart surgery. Do you know someone who's never been a doctor? <laughs> because that's the person I want to go to. I'd like to go to someone who made a lot of money, 
doing something else. Because that's, the, you know, the dream, obviously, of the Republicans, is to, to show that you could be in the private sector, you know, which means, you know, you got rich, and hence you are qualified to be the President of the United States. Um, and there's no other field that people want someone who doesn't know what they're doing. Not, not even mowing your lawn. I need my lawn mowed. Do you know someone who doesn't know how to mow a lawn? I want that guy. <laughs> so, of course, now we have a Congress that is breathtaking. <laughs> breathtaking. We have a Congress that fights about things they don't even know what they are. <laughs> Let me assure you, during that debt ceiling crisis that they made up, they have no idea what debt ceiling is. <laughs> if forced to define it, if they had to go to school saying, you know, and the teacher said, debt ceiling, define it. They, would, they have no idea. The people protesting against raising the debt ceiling, you know, those geniuses, the Tea Party, um, protesting against, they had no idea what it is. You know, they know what debt is because they owe money, believe me. Uh, but they have, they have no idea. And no one will say what any of this stuff really is. You know, it looks like, because there's every day a million new crazy things. Birth control. Birth control. How are we going to progress if we keep going back to these same things that are settled decades and decades ago? Birth control, I don't know where they found that one. Um, but nobody points out what this Tea Party thing is, what this, uh, this all this right-wing right stuff is. This is racism, pure and simple. That's what it is. This is not new. This is old. They put all this stuff around it, you know, was Obama, was he not born in this country? No, he was not. He was born in Malaysia. I could tell. I know many Malaysians. Um, I, I'm, I'm so worldly myself that... <laughs> you know, and so, someone, uh, a few weeks ago, whatever it was, when uh, Obama gave the State of the Union address, uh, someone called me and said, did you see uh, Obama give the State of the Union address? And I said, yes, I saw Obama give the State of the Union address, and then I saw the Republican give the State of the Confederacy address. <laughs> Because that's what this is about. I hope I solved that for you. Yes. Um, I think the question is that um, have all of the, um, in reading, as you say, about the 20s, the 30s, um, uh, she was very uh, impressed by all these big ideas, but now there are no big ideas. Is that because they've all, all the big ideas have been thought of? Of course not. But until the person tells you the big idea, you think that might happen. I mean, there's all these books, you know, in the last, like, maybe 10 years, 20 years, they're, they, they, they're called The End of Something. The end of history, the end of this. I said to a friend of mine, let me promise you that no one under the age of 45 has ever written a book called The End of Anything. You know, I mean, that when people think things end, they mean for them. That's what they mean. Um, and they transpose it onto you. Um, no, of course, all the big ideas have not happened. We just don't know what they are. Because here's the thing about a big idea. Almost no one can have it. That's the thing I was trying to say. In other words, um, there's all kinds of ideas, you know, but really a big idea? I mean, let's look at the fact that people still, to describe a genius, use Einstein. They still use Einstein. You know, it's as if still to describe a singer, you know, people used, you know, uh, a singer from 60 years ago. They don't. And that is because that's how rare genius is. It's rare. These things are rare. That's what I meant by there's so much democracy in the culture. These things, I mean, obviously, the level of genius of Einstein is not just rare, unique. You know, I personally don't even know what he thought of. It's so complicated. <laughs> it, it has been explained to me so many times. I have even read it like Einstein for children, Einstein for toddlers. I read it. I still don't understand it. I have zero idea. So it's not even something that I can apprehend, even in a childish way. Um, but I'm just taking the word of everyone else that it was like really good, what he thought of. Um, so that's how rare that is. You have, of course, periods in history where you have a kind of, um, I don't know what the word would be. You have the Renaissance in Italy. 
You know, what did you need for that renaissance? You know, you needed lots of things to happen at the same time. You know, this is um, kind of accidental. You know, it's accidental you have these artists, these talents. It's accidental that that's the moment you have the Medici. You know, because the one thing, art always needs money. You know, and all these things are accidental. They happen at a certain time. At a certain time, you get these kind of pockets of creativity. And that is because, of course, it's inspiring for artists to have other uh, p people agreeing with you. It's inspiring to anyone to be agreed with. Um, but also, you know, one of the things you don't have now um, is you don't have really an opposition. You have no establishment to go up against. In other words, lots of artists go up against the establishment. Sometimes they're real artistic establishments, like you had in Europe. You didn't ever had that here, you know. But you had that in Europe. You had the Academy in Europe. You could go up against it, you know. Here, you have this constant acceptance of everything, you know. Um, that I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Um, it's it's a good thing for humans. It's a bad thing for art. So human beings may be happier, but the art will be worse. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I still didn't hear you. Who? Elitism. I'm for it. <laughs> I'm for it, especially if I get to decide. And I'm for me deciding, which is incredible elitism. I'm for expertise. Let me put that way. I am for expertise. I am for um, the acknowledgement that some people are better at some things than others, and some people are a lot better at it. And that there are certain things that you cannot do just by wishing, dreaming, or even working very hard. You know, some things you can. You know, I started noticing, I think probably in the 90s, that a lot of the language used by corporations was actually poetic language. You know, you heard corporations start talking about a vision, a mission. You know, the, this is a subterfuge, okay? Corporations don't have visions. Businessmen don't have missions. Business is a, the simplest thing on the planet. Business has one goal. That is to make a profit, period. That is not a bad goal, but that is their goal. They have no other goal. So there's no such thing as a businessman with a vision, okay? Steve Jobs was not a visionary. He was a businessman. Okay, I know I'm not going to get out of this place alive saying this. <laughs> but he didn't invent anything. He's not Thomas Edison. He's a very good businessman. He makes these things. I know you love these things. I'm not saying these things are bad. I'm just saying these things are not Shakespearean sonnets. They are things. They are machines. That's what they are. He made money on them. This is not against the law, but that doesn't make it. When it happened that the day he died, I happened to pass one of the Apple stores in New York. There was a shrine, <laughs> candles, flowers, people crying. <laughs> I mean, this is astonishing. This didn't happen when Henry Ford died. And that's because no one mistook him for a poet. <laughs> yes. You're writing your thesis on Starbucks. I'm glad I'm not your mother. <laughs> you know what, I, I was so busy being in shock that I didn't hear what you said. Please repeat it. Okay, repeat this thing. I don't, now you've completely lost me now. Oh, no, no. What I said was, if there's a Starbucks on Rome, what I meant by that was, um, this really was like less about Starbucks than a person writing a thesis on Starbucks might imagine. Um, <laughs> what, I, what I meant was, well, first of all, I have to preface by saying that I can't be alone in thinking the coffee at Starbucks is terrible. Okay, I mean, it's just terrible coffee. I mean, I, you, I can't imagine what kind of coffee you've experienced to then taste this and think, mmm. <laughs> now, I say this, I have to say, I know this is a much longer, and dig more digressive answer than you expected. Um, I hate to cook, and I am a terrible cook. A really terrible cook. And I really hate to cook. 
but I am the world's greatest maker of coffee. Bar none. I'm the Albert Einstein of coffee making. <laughs> no one, and no restaurant, no person, no cook, no chef, no one makes better coffee than me. Um, so I'm not, but I'm not just comparing my perfect, exquisite coffee to Starbucks. I'm comparing coffee that you would get in a diner to Starbucks. The reason everyone likes that is they must have always had very weak coffee. It's just burnt. That's all it is. It's burnt coffee. Um, so, but what I was saying about it was that Italy, among the millions of wonderful things that the Italians have given to the world, is really delicious coffee. It is ridiculous for there to be a Starbucks in Italy. It's one thing for there to be a Starbucks in Omaha. Okay? There are places where it may be the best coffee. Okay? I admit that that could be the case. I've been in places where it's the best coffee. But Rome is not one of those places. So that is what I meant by that. Yes? You will read it. I will not. <laughs> okay? So here's the thing you have to understand when you say we as a society. I mean, some people will read all this Twitter stuff. Awesome, you know, I know tons of people are reading this. I'm not one of those people. Okay? So, but this is not, I believe, not meant to be literature to begin with. This is just meant to communicate. The difference is, I suppose, I mean, that it's written in some way rather than spoken. This is really just conversation. I realize because you know, of the ability to disseminate it. You know, it looks more like, say, a newspaper or a news broadcast or something like that um, because that many people can read it. A zillion people can read it. Apparently, a zillion people can read it. A zillion people are able to read it, and perhaps they do read it. I will not be one of those people, okay? Um, I am not against people doing this. I am just against having to hear about it all the time. Okay? I don't care if they do it. It's, you know, it, uh, um, I... I I just wish that people would understand the difference between all people have opinions. All human beings, even three-year-old children have opinions. That's what a tantrum is. <laughs> that doesn't make it an idea. Yes? Um, in what ways have you seen New York change uh, since 9-11? Um, well, there's a lot more tolerance for very um, invasive policing, in my opinion. Um, now, I have to participate by saying that Ray Kelly, the police commissioner, is a friend of mine. Personally, I like him a great deal. Um, he is also very clean, by which I mean not corrupt with money. He lives in a one-bedroom apartment, and believe me, this is not common for a New York City police commissioner, um, or any police commissioner. You know, But I am a person who values my privacy very much. I do not even have an easy pass. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's a you must have some equivalent here. We don't have tolls here. Um, you must use all your tax money for the roads. Um, <laughs> that's why you have no libraries. Um, <laughs> but it's a, an electronic device that you, you know, registers your, instead of paying a toll, it pays a toll. Um, when they invented easy passes, I wouldn't get one. Um, and everyone said, why don't you get an easy pass? Because it's so easy. Um, and you don't have to wait in line. And, and I said, because it tells where you are. You know, it tells your car went through this toll at a certain time, and um, everyone says, so what? I said, well, I don't want them to know where I am. And they say, who's them? I said, whoever gives us these easy passes. Whoever has these records. If someone has them. It's not me. I don't want them to know. Uh, why not? Are you doing anything wrong? No, I'm not doing anything wrong, but I feel that it should not be common knowledge when I went to Connecticut. I just don't think that's any of their business. Um, so we have now... Uh, and not just in New York, but there's a tremendous uh, number of surveillance cameras. Um, they are everywhere. They are, uh, they are, the police are allowed um, to search you. The police are allowed, periodically, uh, the cops will search your bags going into the subway. Now, I don't carry a bag, and I never have, uh, but if I was carrying a bag and a cop asked to search my bag, I would not let him. It is unconstitutional. I, no one's challenged this. But we have a constitution, you know, and I am, here's the thing, I think one of the most dangerous phrases in the world to gain traction is better safe than sorry. You know, I do not think we should value safety over freedom. I don't. I think it's dangerous. I do. I think it's really dangerous. 
um, for some reason, even though I am, let me assure you, a very cowardly person physically, I wasn't that scared by 9-11 as many people were. I was in New York when it happened. Um, I mean, I was as astonished by it, you know, but I wasn't as afraid of it. It didn't make me fearful in that way. I am more fearful of this kind of surveillance. I mean, then of that happening again, I really don't think that would happen again no matter what they did. I really think, I know that after that happened, everyone thought these people were geniuses. You know, just the way that the first World Trade Center bombing, everyone thought they were morons. You know, I mean, the terrorists. Um, and then the 9-11 happened, everyone thought they were geniuses. You know, neither thing is true. What happened on 9-11 was, an, it's just like the Renaissance. It's like the Renaissance in reverse. A number of things had to happen simultaneously for that to be that successful. And the first thing that had to happen was all four of those planes had to leave on time. What are the odds of that? <laughs> That's never happened. But that was key to that working the way that it did. Um, all those things had happened, and there had to be, you know, you had to have George Bush as the president. There were a lot of things had to be in place for that to happen. Um, <clears throat> so th it was really a lucky thing for them. I, I really don't fear that happening again. I don't mean there never will be another terrorist act in the United States. You know, I don't know why the United States thought there was going to be terrorist acts everywhere in the world, but not here. You know, like we had some natural immunity to it. Um, but, you know, I think mostly in the ways that it's changed is that. You know, and that, and that people will, in the name of safety, tolerate ever more invasion into their rights. Their constitutional rights. You know, I value that more. Yes. Could I talk a little bit about my writing process? Very little. I could talk very little about my writing process because I write very little. But my writing process basically is trying to force myself to write. That is my writing process. My, so my writing process mostly I would describe as the rest of my life, which is all the things I do not to write. You know, I've often noted um, how unusually neat writers' apartments are. And, and that is because they think, who could write in a house that has an unfolded towel? No one. I should fold my towels. You know, I cannot possibly, right, in a house where I think I don't have any toothpicks. I have to go buy toothpicks. You know, so putting things off, you know, is it more my writing process than writing. I think you should save this question for someone more prolific. I think you should wait till a writer who comes who's written more than two books. Because they would undoubtedly have a writing process. Yes. What is the purpose of education? You're asking me that? Yeah. <laughs> um, the purpose of education, I believe, um, is to, to, first of all, teach people history, by which I mean all the things that happened before they were born, or all the important things, or as many as you can, so that they don't think everything that happens has never happened before. That would be so useful to this Congress, for instance. Um, so I, you know, I said this before to the, these students. Almost everything you learn in school is history in a way, you know, because they're not going to teach you in school something that hasn't been invented yet, you know. So <clears throat> that, I think that's the purpose of an education. I also think it would be nice if during this endless process now of how long it takes to educate someone, um, they would instill in people habits of education, by which I mean reading, noticing things. Noticing is good, you know, other, other uh, people call it observing, you know, but noticing is the same thing. Uh, you know, questioning, not just answering. See, one of the worst things about people who are younger than me, which is now most people, um, is that they were taught to have so much self-esteem um, that they're just full of answers at like the age 12. And I think really, people, my friends ask their children questions throughout their whole life. I would always think, why would you ask a child the question, what would they know? They, they couldn't possibly know anything. So I think the habit of asking questions or looking things up in some way. You can do it on a computer. Um, I think that's the purpose of education. Uh, you know, or I suppose some actual skills. But I'm certain that in this liberal arts environment you aren't asking about actual skills. <laughs> yes? Um, I think there's a tremendous amount of freedom. I, he, the question was, in what way do I think writers, particularly journalists, journalists, are restricted from saying what they think? I mean, not I mean, not officially restricted. I mean, people may feel 
um, I think people seem not to have an idea really what censorship is. Censorship comes from the government. It comes from the government, period. That's censorship. Censorship is when the, the state says, you can't write this, you can't print this, you can't say that. That's censorship. You know, there's millions of other ways to restrict things, but I think people shouldn't use the word censorship except in that way, you know, because it's such an extreme, horrible thing that a state can do that you shouldn't compare other types of restrictions to it. Yes? They can, but it doesn't have the weight of state. Of course they do. They can and they do. You know, um, any, I mean, any private enterprise can do that. I mean, just the way a, a private corporation, they could, if they wanted to say, everyone who works here has to wear an orange tie. They could say that. I mean, McDonald's says something like that, don't they? I mean, so, uh, and they could say, within your job, they could say you can't say this. Now, I know that, in my opinion, there's been a lot of overreach by corporations, which is the same kind of overreach of the police, you know, looking in your bag before you get on the subway. You know, I mean, there are... Uh, corporations that say you can't smoke cigarettes if you work in this corporation. I don't mean in the office. I mean at all. That's insane to me. That's not their business, you know. And there's all kinds of things like that, you know. Um, I think one of the things most lacking in the in the culture now is boundaries. That what is public, what is private, you know, what is there. Just no. The lines are very blurry, and it's very important because it allows nefarious. Um, operators like corporations to get away with quite a lot. I mean, you know, they, they give you this phrase, corporate citizen. There's a, what is a corporate citizen? There's such a thing as a corporate citizen. You know, um, corporations give back. What does that mean? What did give back what? You mean what they stole? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't understand what I'm saying. To me, I, I don't think there are great, there, there, I don't think there are serious restrictions. I don't. There are countries where there are. Uh, this, this is still, at the moment, not one of them. I think there's a lot more self-censorship, actually. I think people more fear um, some kind of, uh, not retribution, but people, one thing that ha has changed is that high school never seems to end. You know, so that people really are concerned with their peer group, even if they're 50 years old. You know, that's something you really are supposed to outgrow. You know, um, that would be in the definition of an adult. So people are like think, well, my friends, my peer group, they don't believe this. They don't think this, I do, I don't want to say it, I don't want to write it, but that would be your fault, not the government's. Yes? What do I think the role of humor in society and who do I look up to, humor-wise, humor you mean? Um, the role of humor in society is to laugh. That is the role, that's it. There's no other role. I mean, to me, that's enough, I mean, uh, Laughing is important. People enjoy laughing. Who do I look up to? Um, I'm not that bigger, big a looker-upper. You might be shocked to hear. Um, <laughs> like, give me an example. I mean, there are people I like, the people I think are funny, but I would say, look up to? No, I can't think of anyone. No one springs to mind. Yes. I never smoked an electronic cigarette because they're too complicated. <laughs> I mean, as you can imagine, I've been given several. I'm the recipient of uh, quite a large number of electronic cigarettes. They have batteries. Did you know that? Batteries. I'm sorry? Yes, batteries. I don't have anything that has a battery. Uh, they really look complicated to me, and they don't look that enjoyable. You know, I know that cigarettes, uh, everyone, you know, thinks they're so horrible, but to people who smoke them, they're enjoyable. That's why we smoke them. It's not to irritate you. Um, so <laughs> I know you think that, but it's, it's not true. Um, so uh, it doesn't look enjoyable to me. Also, it turns out, someone told me this, I was interested in them only because I think, well, I asked, what is that stuff that comes out uh, of them? It's water. I don't know if you knew this, but basically it's water. This, it looks like smoke, but it's steam. So I said, well, you can smoke them on a plane. Apparently, someone I know was, had theirs confiscated on a plane. I found this very interesting, okay? Because personally, I have to tell you, I know no one agrees with me, but this whole smoking thing, um, here's what I think about it. I do not believe secondhand smoke is dangerous. I do not believe it. I believe firsthand smoke is dangerous, but not secondhand smoke. How do I know this? I'm 61. 
I have known people who died of every imaginable thing. I have never known anyone who died from someone else smoking. Never. Okay? If you think secondhand smoke is dangerous, how could you possibly drive a car and put all that carbon monoxide into the atmosphere? How could that possibly be true? I don't believe it. I believe they came up with it because they couldn't get the smokers to stop smoking. So they thought, how will we get people to stop smoking? Tattletales. <laughs> it worked in third grade, it's gonna work now. That's how. And here's the other thing I think about the smoking thing, not that you asked me, but I'm always happy to have the opportunity. This came from the left, this anti-smoking thing. It came from the left and it came from California. It came from a congressman in Los Angeles. And it was very hard to do this because smoking, although everyone seems to think it's just characteristic of a devil, is an addiction. It's an actual addiction, the one no one feels sorry for. Okay, oh, you're a heroin addict, I feel so sorry for you. It's an addiction, it's not a character trait. So it was very, and it was an addiction that was completely incorporated into life. So that, you know, it was, it, it was in every kind of way, a habit, a social habit. A, so it, was, it took 30 years to get people to come to their present stance on smoking, which is that nothing could possibly be worse in the world. Nothing. And while the left was doing this, which took a tremendous amount of money, a tremendous amount of money, a tremendous amount of research, a tremendous amount of lying, um, and a tremendous amount of effort. While you were doing this, the right came and they took your country and they put it in their pocket. And you're never getting it back. Okay? This was a tiny thing. A tiny thing. A matter of personal health, really. You know, health is not a religion. You know, for the, we have a country tremendously concerned with health, yet with horrible healthcare system. That's health. You know, not your diet, what you eat. That's vanity. Okay? That's not health. You know, I'm a vegetarian. I don't care. I really don't care. It's not interesting. Um, I don't care. Be a vegetarian. Fine. Okay? Being a vegetarian doesn't make you Albert Schweitzer, by the way. Okay? It's not really a boon to mankind that you're a vegetarian. Um, a boon to mankind would be if we had a healthcare system. That would be a boon to mankind. I know you didn't ask me that, but that's what I think. <laughs> yes? I don't know why, but it's a lucky thing for me because I have a huge rent, okay? I mean, I have, let me put it this way. I have an apartment in New York big enough to hold 8,500 books, okay? So that's why I do this, but I don't know why. I think it's because I think about things, you know, and I think about things because I don't do that many things. You can't do both, by the way. You can't, see, most people I know, they really work hard, but I don't, okay? I think I'm languid. You know, this comes from lying around, thinking, you know, I have time to do that because I don't have a job. <laughs> and I have no children, okay? So up until fairly recently, where I turned out to have to take care of my mother, um, I just had to take care of myself. I, my whole life was very careful to have no responsibilities. Okay, that is very important, okay? It is centrally important that you have no responsibilities, or as few as you can manage. Okay, at a certain age, you find out your father dies, he leaves you your mother. You didn't know this was gonna happen, but it happened. Okay, but generally, for as long as you possibly can, no responsibilities, okay? No pets, no children, no spouse, none of it. Then you have time to think, okay? Obviously, very few pe people at any given time can do that. Luckily, I'm one of those people. So all the effort is the beginning of your life, you know, where you front load your life with no responsibility. I don't even have a plant. <laughs> There's nothing alive in my apartment. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
Um, the first question was, do I ever think we'll have a woman president? Apparently not. Apparently, we're just not progressive enough. I mean, think of the countries that have a woman president. These are countries we used to call third world countries. They are so far ahead of us. Um, I, I, so far, we have not, as you know, had a woman president. Probably eventually we'll have a woman president. I probably won't live to see it because I smoke. If you sit next to me, <laughs> if you sit next to me, you will not live to see it either. Um, I mean, although it might happen kind of spontaneously, I mean, I did, you didn't, haven't known me long enough since we just met, but you could ask any of my friends that I've had for many decades, I always said we'll have a black president before we have a woman president. I knew that, you know, I knew that. Whether we have a black president, a woman president, is up to white men. Everything is up to white men, okay? Pretty much everything, even it turns out the Oscars you know, they find this year, who are the Oscar voters? No one ever knew. Turns out the Oscar voters are A, 93% white. 93% white. Sweden isn't 93% white. <laughs> <laughs> and 77% male. 77% male. Uh, so, um, that is kind of the country. You know, I mean, not the, the actual citizens of the country, but the people who control everything, you know. So basically, I think it's just a matter of waiting until they die. You have to wait until they die. Till the, these, like, there are like three generations of these guys, okay? So I can't see you from here, but I will not live this long, okay? So you have to wait for these guys to die off because one thing is that people younger, they are much better about this, much. This is the biggest leap. They are much better about stuff like this, a billion times better. I don't know how this happened, but it did. So they are much, much better about this. Um, so I suppose eventually it will happen. But it will never be equal, ever. You know, uh, you know, someone once asked me, do I think racism will ever end? And I said, well, I don't think it ever will, but it could because it's a fantasy. Racism is a fantasy of superiority. But gender differences are real. They are biological, you know. And so they will never end. You know, it will never end. Testosterone will not end. Especially since now they just make it. You know, I mean, well, you know, it used to like, at least they used to get all these guys. You know, then they invented Viagra. It's the only thing medical science has come up with in my lifetime. Viagra. Like, really. In my whole life they cured one thing, polio. They cured polio, then 50 years go by, nothing. Nothing. They cure cancer, no. Heart disease, no. Nothing. Viagra, they come up with. Viagra. Like, this was a huge medical problem. <laughs> like, <clears throat> they work on what they care about. <laughs> okay? So, they, instead of inventing a cure for cancer, they invent a Viagra, which I call the bane of the third wife. Yes. How do I feel about the role of religion in politics? There should be no role of religion in politics. We have a constitution. Am I the only person who remembers this constitution? <laughs> it's like, in answer to your question now, I gave you an incorrect answer. The goal of education is teach the constitution. <laughs> and in response to these people, these Republicans, who always say, um, <coughs> Uh, they would say, uh, the Constitution uh, doesn't guarantee, what did they say? The Constitution doesn't guarantee um, separation of church and state. Uh, it doesn't protect, what, is it? what do they say? This, this thing that is completely incorrect. You know, <coughs> there, it protects their right to have their religion. It does not protect, it, there is no such right. There's no right of religion in politics. There is the opposite. There is the opposite. There are countries that are theocracies. They are free to move there. I will drive them. <laughs> <laughs> and yet it's interesting, these are the countries they hate the most. It's so interesting to me. They are obsessed with bombing these countries that are mostly theocrat you know, theocracies. They hate these countries the most. They're the most upset about them. They are exactly like them. Yes.
You can go first, then she can go. Just like life. <laughs> uh, I love that question. He said, I want to know my opinion of the Robert Supreme Court. Um, I have a very, very low opinion of the Robert Supreme Court. Could not be lower. Extremely low. And I have to say, when I was talking before about um, things, uh, something, things I wanted to be when uh, I was a child, um, as an adult, I really want to be a Supreme Court judge. I have wanted to be this my entire adult life. I would be perfect for this job. <laughs> I make snap judgments, okay? It wouldn't take me long, all right? And I am very judgmental. You will not meet a more judgmental person than I am. And you do not have to be a lawyer to be on the Supreme Court. And I am not a lawyer, so I'm ready. Uh, I would say the biggest um, disappointment, maybe, maybe that's too mild a word, uh, in my adult life was Bush v. Gore. I was shocked. I was as shocked by that as I was by 9-11. As shocked. I'm not comparing the two events, but I was as shocked by Bush v. Gore. I couldn't believe it. I was flabbergasted. And also, up until that moment, I admired Sandra Day O'Connor. I didn't like her politics, but I admired her as a woman who did what she did very, very hard, what she did, and extremely hard. Uh, a young man such as yourself doesn't even understand what, how hard that was. And then she took that and trashed it in Bush v. Gore. And I happen to slightly know David Boyce, who argued the Gore side, the Supreme Court. And I saw him after. I also, uh, that's the first time that I, you know, they, they showed on C-SPAN the, well, they didn't show the thing because there's no cameras allowed in the Supreme Court. A very good idea, by the way, something I wish would spread to all courtrooms. Um, but they had, like, the, you know, drawings of the Supreme Court, and they gave you the audio. And so I listened to the entire thing. I was riveted to it. And afterward, after we lost, um, uh, I said, I, I saw David Boyce who argued for Gore, and I said, what was wrong with you? I mean, I could have argued that in one second. You, all you, he said, what are you talking, he was furious at me, of course. Um, he said, because you could, you, here's what a big ego is with a man. You lose Bush v. Gore and you're still arrogant. <laughs> a woman who lost something like that, you'd never see her again. She'd be embarrassed. Um, I said, well, here's what you should have said. Because I, th that was the first time I realized what it was to argue in front of the Supreme Court, how different it is from being in a regular courtroom. I said, you should have said, you must let us continue to count the votes. Because if I was looking for a one-word definition of democracy, that would be counting. In countries where they don't count, that is not democracy. You know, so, but the Robert Supreme Court is even worse than that court was. And the court will continue to get worse and worse. You know, that is why it is so important who the president is and who the Congress is. It's really, really important. And one of the most important aspects of it is they choose the people for the Supreme Court, who, as you know, have lifetime tenure and never die. <laughs> they never die. It is a guarantee of unbelievable longevity to get appointed to the Supreme Court. You could, it doesn't matter what your habits are. You could be a drunk, you could be a smoke, you could be a heroin addict. You'll live to be 150 years. And I think, why is this? And that is because it is such a good job. It is so fun. You look, and when you look at it, I've, I'm filled with envy when I see them. It is such a good job. They wear a beautiful robe. They make decisions. People ask them to make these giant decisions. And they have writers. They don't write that themselves. Law clerks write them. Interns. So that is uh, something I wish very much uh, that I would be. This, and Roberts is really young to be Chief Justice. He's, he was really young when he was appointed. He's still really young. He'll live another 50 years. If you have children, they'll live under that Supreme Court. And it's a really, really bad court. It's a disgrace to the country, to put it lightly. Yes? Ha <laughs> 
I don't quite understand your question, but you, you said that a lot of people your age thought of a lot of new ideas, but a lot of them were really bad. Almost, most of everything is bad. Okay, I mean, it's not just your ideas. Almost everything is bad. Most hamburgers are bad, right? I mean, most people are not that delightful. Um, you know, generally speaking, that's what most means. Okay, <laughs> that they're, you know, they're not that good. Um, I, it, it, I, it's not my impression that tons of people are trying to come up with new ideas. Um, you may have that impression if you think an idea is an app. Okay? <laughs> That's not an idea. And trying to come up with new ways of making money, those are not ideas. Okay? I mean, thinking of new ways to make money, that's not an idea. That's greed. There's a difference between these two things. One of the goals of education is to teach you definition of words. Yes. <laughs> um, I really don't think that look that admiring the Renaissance is nostalgia. Um, first of all, nostalgia, usually, in my definition of it, it has to be personal, and I'm not that old, honey. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, nostalgia is when someone my age says, oh, do you see the stones in 75? That's nostalgia. Okay? Um, it, no one alive knew Leonardo. Okay? Um, that, there's, of course, a difference between history and nostalgia, um, and I'm certain that you know that because you're a college student um, at an elite university. Uh, so, there is a difference between these two things, um, and one of the differences is that if you really learn history, you will know the difference between these two things. Yes? Well, <clears throat> James Baldwin, the first time I became aware of him, I saw him on television. I mean, the idea that someone like James Baldwin would be on television now is out of the question. You know, I mean, uh, I'm not saying television was very elevated, you know, in 1961 or two, whenever I saw this, but James Baldwin was on television. He was on a talk show. Uh, talk shows were not exactly like they were now. They were actually about talking um, as opposed to selling. Um, and I never heard James Baldwin. I didn't know anything about him. My mother was watching a TV show called David Susskind. It was a talk show. And she's watching this guy on TV, so I start watching it. And I was completely astonished by the level of his conversation. I just never heard anyone talk like that. It's as simple as that. I mean, I never heard conversation at that level, you know. Uh, and that is because I did not grow up in a house of intellectuals. And, uh, you know, so I just was riveted by him. I found that he was a writer, I went to the library, I got his books. So he was very influential in that way to me, which was that I saw, oh, here's another world. You know, this, there's this other world. Um, and that was revelatory to me. Um, so that uh, he was very important that way. He was not very important in the sense of influencing my writings, obviously a vastly different writer uh, than I am. But um, I, I would say that, you know, as a... I don't know, as a, a, a person uh, in the culture, he had a tremendous effect on me, uh, too, in addition to it. Yes, he had a very, um, and I also, James Baldwin, you know, I'm not sure how old he was. He was in his 60s when he died. You know, it's very stressful being someone like James Baldwin. You know, it is really, really stressful. And he smoked a lot, but none of the people around him died, just him. <laughs> okay, he died from smoking, but the people around him are still alive. It's an amazing thing. I know you don't believe it. Um, he also drank a lot, and those people who didn't, they're alive. Um, although secondhand drinking, much more dangerous than secondhand smoking, <laughs> especially if you drive. Um, yes, and, uh, and I, you know, uh, surely that had a hand in creating him as an artist. And certainly as an essayist, it did. You know, certainly as an essayist. To be black, to be gay, of course. Uh, especially in the era that he was. You know, I didn't know him. I know his sister. Um, he has a sister who's alive. He has more than one. He came from a family of 10 children. Um, and, <coughs> you, know, uh, you know, I don't know 
nor would he know which, which you know, being black or being gay, which of these things shaped him in which ways. You can't know that. I mean, you can't know that about yourself, and so hence other people can't know that about you. You know, you can't know all the little things in your environment that affect you. You know, you, you, and so when people say this happened because of this, you know, it's a guess at best. You know, a, 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 even about themselves, let alone when other people make that, you know, decision. Um, but certainly, of course, you know, if all it took to be uh, an artist at the level of James Baldwin is to be gay and black, there'd be a lot more. That's my point. Okay, those th those things are not th those things are aspects of his life. They shaped him, but they're not talent that he just had. <coughs> yes. Why do I think it's taking so long for the United States to sue uh, to approve same-sex marriage? Well, for one, perhaps you don't know this, it's not a federal matter. So the United States is never going to approve it. I mean, I know they put this thing in the Constitution, the amendment, or it's not in the Constitution, but whatever this thing that you met, what, I can't remember what it's called, Defense of Marriage Act. Clinton. Clinton, Defense of Marriage Act. Now, I don't know why it's taking so long. To me, it doesn't seem like it's taking so long. To me, it's astonishing it exists at all. Let me assure you, for someone of my age, these words together would have been a joke. Gay marriage. It wouldn't even have been a joke because it's not that amusing. But I mean, it, it just, it wouldn't have occurred to anyone that I know. It would, by the way, me, it still doesn't occur to me. I don't care if you want to do it, go ahead, be my guest. But personally, I don't think anyone should be allowed to get married. Because when they, when, when proponents of gay marriage talk about it publicly, you know, from a political point of view, they always say the same thing. If, if I was allowed to get married, if my spouse was dying in the hospital, I could go visit him. And I think, I don't want to visit someone in the hospital. To me, being gay, a fabulous excuse not to go visit someone in the hospital. <laughs> like, to me, I just don't find it that sexy. Visiting someone in the hospital. This is not something I'm gonna lobby for. Um, and then all the other advantages are financial. They're all financial. They're all tax breaks or they're financial advantages. I do not approve of this as a single person. I do not think that married people should get tax benefits that I don't get. That is what I think. Because the reason that all these tax benefits accrue to married couples is because there was a time when the society thought it's very central and important to society to have people get married so that men will stay home and raise their children with the wife. Otherwise, men leave. That, that was a way to keep men home. Okay? It never occurred to them that two men would stay home together. This would never occur to anyone. And by the way, of the few gay marriages I know among men, they don't. Okay? Because you may think they're gay, but they're men. Okay? So, you know, I don't care if people want to have gay marriage. Have it. As long as it's not mandatory. <laughs> yes. Yes, but I, my, I, my, you, you have been here like two hours misunderstanding me. Um, equ the equality guaranteed in the Constitution is political equality, equality of rights. It is not equality of outcomes. It is not, I mean, every single human being or every single American in the Constitution should have equal rights. That's what's in the Constitution. It doesn't mean it happened, but we have this wonderful document. You know, we have like a recipe for this, should we care to actually make this recipe. It doesn't say every single person is going to be beautiful and tall. Every single, there's numerous advantages human beings can have over each other. You know, people are at birth incredibly unequal. The number one unequal thing is, is actually when you're born. You know, are you born to, you know, incredibly rich people? Ah, you won. <laughs> you know, in one way, maybe in other ways you didn't. But I mean... That, yes, the Constitution is a written document. It's not the real world. You know, it's a great written, do written document, and if the real people in the real world would try to follow it, the real world would be better. That, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that, that equality doesn't mean sameness. It doesn't mean everybody is the same. 
It just means everyone deserves the same rights. Everyone gets the same rights. We, we're not even there yet. We, we are so far from everyone getting their same rights. I would worry more about that and less about whether everyone gets published in The New Yorker. If that's your goal. I'm just guessing. Yes. Do I think religion is a net positive or a net negative in the world? Um, well, so far, it doesn't look to me like it's doing that much good. I mean, I'm not an expert on religion. You know, in fact, whatever the opposite of an expert on religion, that's me. Okay? So the manifestations I see of religion um, so far have been startlingly bad. Now, I'm hoping that these are just people the people that I'm aware of, I'm aware of because they made me aware of them, and that the actual good religious people are quietly being religious. I'll go with that. <laughs> but of course, I have no evidence of that because they're very quietly doing it. Yes. What was it like to work for Andy Warhol? You should have asked that like 45 minutes ago because I am getting a signal that I am supposed to be finishing up. Okay? Um, so. If you call me, I'll tell you. Thank you very much. Good night.